Uh, oh, so for D Ray Torah. Okay, so we're on page 276. Uh, Absolutely. And so as we continue on with quote the best of Talmud, this is one little piece that is often quoted. And then we're going to move into doing Passover. And spend we, most of our time on Passover. Are we start with making matzah? Mm -hmm. Is that the cool on Making matzah? Yes. Getting, getting the, the kitchen clean in preparation. <laughs> Actually, we're going to talk about when is Passover. So that's a, a perhaps even more fundamental question. Okay, 276. Alan, could you pick up there, please? Up? Yes. Rabbi? He has said, all, all is in control of heaven, um, except for fear of heaven. That's what he said. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear him? Is the fear of heaven just a small thing then? Yes. For most of teacher, it was a small thing. If you ask someone for a large item and he has it, it's like a small thing to him. If you ask him for a small item and he doesn't have it, it's like a large thing to him. Rabbi Aviera said, if someone says Shema Shema, is like saying, we give thanks, we give thanks. He gives the impression of serving two powers. They objected to Rabbi Aviera. It's Zera. Zera. Yeah. If someone's, because usually in Hebrew, uh, yes. transliteration, transliteration. Every vowel is a syllable. And, and with, which is probably true, but I think this was like either UK or Canadian written. So that's why some of the uh, transliterations are a little different than we're used to. Okay. If someone says Shema and doubles it, it's improper. Improper, but you don't have to silence him. No objection if he repeats word by word. It is improper, but does not appear to be serving two powers. If he repeats verse by verse, it's like serving two powers, and he should be silenced. Okay, so they, obviously this was a kind of a backlash against Zoroastrianism. So they wanted to make sure that there was no... Uh, Problem. If one said it twice, why did he do it? Maybe because this next paragraph, someone was lacking in concentration. So, what Zoroastrianism? Zoroastrianism is where there's a in, in their religion there's God and a demiurge, um, and so thus two powers that are ruling over instead of a singular God, as in Judaism. I see. Uh, Rob Papa said to, to um, Rabbi, perhaps he's only repeating the words. He didn't concentrate the first time, and now he's concentrating. Uh, do you treat heaven like a familiar friend? He told the rabbi, if he, if he didn't concentrate, clearly the hammer, so he does concentrate. Okay, so just make sure you know that. <laughs> anyone who mentions the scriptural verses about forbidden sexual unions, metaphorically should be silenced. Rabbi Yosef gave an example. If someone said to you, you should not uncover your father's nakedness or your mother's nakedness, it meant we shouldn't reveal anything that might embarrass them. Okay, so remember the beginning of this Mishnah. Now, Mishnah we usually follow, right? Mishnah came before Gemara, and at the beginning of the Mishnah it says, do not interpret any of these verses as metaphorical. But here we're going to find out that these, you know, Moraim are going to say, it's metaphorical. Okay. So that one particular is metaphor? Uh, you know, as they say, there's, there's obviously more than one way to interpret. Um, but the actual interpretation in this particular case is probably true, but Robert, as well as as well as this one too. But the Rav Yosef apparently believes it's metaphorical. But the previous sentence says anyone who interprets these things metaphorically should be silenced. So does right. the Rav Yosef should be silenced for that? Um, I think that they're letting Rav Yosef's opinion stand, especially in light of the last paragraph. So go ahead and read that. If anyone interprets, you should not give your seat to pass over the, the Moab. It's taught in the school of Rabbi Ishmael. The Mishnah has in mind someone says that scripture here speaks of an Israelite who had sex with a non Israelite woman and engendered a child of idolatry. Okay. So, what is engendered? Um, it's probably sort of birthed. Were created destined. Yeah, destined. Oh. Right. So the child is engendered a child for idolatry? No, idolatry. Right. Yes. The child, the, because if, if this fellow had sex with that girl and she had a child and she was not Jewish and belonged to a group of people that worshipped idols, then 
then the child would be raised to worship idols. And in this case, when they say you shall not give of your seed to pass over to Bullock, is this a metaphorical or not a metaphorical? This is how this is interpreted. Bullock was the, uh, at least at some thought, the god who, you know, was the, the one where they were burning their firstborns. They were throwing their, you know, firstborn kids into the fire. Human sacrifice. Human sacrifice. I think it's going to be in that um, we, try, we try to teach our, our sons not, not to get, like, get involved with non-Jewish girls because it's kind of like that soul that's been born is, is just totally lost. Okay? And this is kind of the extreme example that that, that, that soul will be But they were, what was surprising is at the very of the beginning of the Bible, there are stories where parents were getting the, the son marrying you know, somebody out of the tribe. They weren't even talking about Jews. They were like, what is it, Esau decided to take a second wife from Ishmael, right? Mm -hmm. In order to please his parents. It's a kind of cute on Esau's part, you know. He already get one far, far from some neighbor, uh, neighbor uh, some uh, wife. So this is like second to be his second. I, I didn't realize it till this year. I mean, I read this story before, but it's very, uh, but also there are some movies now about like Indians and Arabs being, that uh, Arabs movie about Arab community in Turkey, a long time ago in, in Canada, where a woman tries to marry an you know, Arab guy and how much difficulty there is. Uh, Arab, uh, Arab, uh, Power machine, gender, whatever. And then, uh, and then this uh, Indian uh, guy tries to marry a non Indian woman, a blonde kind of Indian woman from the New York area. Are you referring to, are you referring to the, uh, the one that opens the mechanic shop and the daughter of the, of the mechanic shop owner? That, that actually is another one, no, which is an Israeli girl no. who falls for an Arab guy oh, okay. and whatever no, is, is on Netflix that. available currently. Well, I yeah, have a view that we don't like people marry out of faith, but, but there she is. But, yes, there is that. But the similarity in other cultures. It's yes, not, yes. No, no, it's not just us. Europe. That's very true. <laughs> not just us. Not just us. And recently, yeah. uh, Russia is also refusing to use like this modern like of Jewish trade that we all try to but uh, now I think in the United Other States, cultures have a Other similar, have very similar consciousness. Yeah. yeah, we we haven't moved on out of this kind of uh, mindset uh, currently. So that's where we're at. Okay. Um, we, look, we look at the concert the same way yesterday. Look at the what? The concert the same way yesterday. Yeah. How, How so? so? <clears throat> if you listen to the music. And, and that we should be a one world, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's that's not necessary to us. That's it's a part. And you, you know, you, you can go do this. Lit, lit, you, in, in terms of the, the the themes of the music that was played yesterday for the free concert at Sunday night, it was very much a um, uh, interfaith um, foundation. Theme. Uh -huh. Yeah, because that's her, her. She's married to. Kimball, who's not Jewish. Who's not Jewish. What, I, I'm not sure what his faith background might be, but at any rate, uh, yeah, it, it was, uh, it's not something, I mean, when we come up to tour, that's the one place where we typically draw the line. If nowhere else, it's Bahar Banu, who has chosen us. So for, in terms of Aliyot, you know, we have the Jewish spouse at least come up, or however that works, and there may be additional folks who come mm -hmm. with them. In certain synagogues, and and some synagogues draw the line at the bima, that they can't walk up onto the bima itself. So that's depending upon where one is at in in the tribe as to how far right or how far left one is willing to go. I used to be the center in Sikh Judaism that um, a couple would uh, an intermarried couple, the Jewish spouse or the Jewish partner would go up bima, and in some synagogues. The non-Jewish uh, person would stand during the tour. But you know, I discovered oh, that the Jewish uh, Jewish uh, spouse also stands up. 
we just got some people that moved from Ireland or some place. Yes, yeah. New York, from New York originally. That's, right. that's, that's right. another, another custom. That's different. Also custom. Yes. Oh. Um, however, it was a fairly big deal in the 90s when the Center of Judaism for the Island, and actually it was right after Center of 2000, so it was right 2000 when there was a whole seminar across America that wanted to talk about how to make the Center of Judaism more inclusive. And one of the things we talked about was. Um, Do you remember the issue of Aliyah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and so so the big movement at that time was to have. Um, a non-Jewish um, um, partner come up to the booth. So that was kind of a big deal. Yeah, when that that, you're right. Absolutely. Yeah, it was a rule. I, uh, I was so way out of this that I didn't know about that. And when, uh, only uh -huh. like years later, I suddenly see that there's all inclusive brochures coming to the lobby of our center when we support. Like in 2004, five, suddenly there was a change. Yeah. We, uh, when my sons were in school, they the school didn't want to take a job, which was in our neighborhood. His mother was, a, she was Lutheran by birth, so she was totally an atheist, burning mm -hmm. atheist. And, and uh, yes, and she wasn't going to convert for any other reason. And the girl wanted to go, boy, the, boy, the son and the daughter wanted to go to Jewish school for whatever reason. And he was an Orthodox in New York. So this is. Very kind of painful case for me because uh, I knew these kids from our neighborhood, and suddenly everything is fine. They're in school, and uh, but the parents didn't want to buy for her filling because she's from Orthodox background. So this poor girl suffered from every son, <laughs> and I wound up uh, well, I was a British affair and all that, but I wound up making feeling for her. Huh. Out of the box in Google, I then I Google, this is going to be like in 2005 or 6 million, I bet, just before we came here. And I Google, what are you writing to Helen? Got some parchment, wrote it out for her, we made boxes, and, uh, and she said she preferred uh, a ribbon, satin ribbon, instead of leather belt. Uh -huh. uh, and she was pretty against this. <laughs> Interesting. And I, I didn't know any of the civil civil two thousand. In fact, in fact, each of them, there are a lot of there are a lot of really small details which are big details. Like how do you address mail to a family where one of one of the partners is Jewish? Like let's say that you kid that um, Mr. and Mrs. Cohen, except except you know it's it's Emmanuel Cohen. He, he marries Christina. You know, and I'm Jew. So how do you address mail to this family exactly? Because. So in some synagogues, technically only the Jewish um, partner is a member of the synagogue, right. and the other partner happens not to be. But what if they have children? What if the children convert? So they're also members of the synagogue. And just how you how you address well to them is, is is kind of a big deal. <laughs> because it's, it's whether or not you, you intend to be inclusive of this family or right. not. Right. Right. Exactly. So right. It's kind of a big deal. In Reform synagogue, it's not it's not a big deal at all. Right. They're they're all members. But then somebody complained to me that in uh, during uh, Rabbi Sorfer's time, uh, maybe 10 years ago, I don't know, people remember, right? Oh, yeah. Somebody, non-Jewish family member was not allowed to be there. No, actually what the, the situation was, it was a, a Jewish person who had refused to pass on. Oh, he's actually a survivor, of course. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. so he, he's actually a survivor. Which is a whole other piece of it, um, <coughs> and at the time had refused, literally refused to pass on this tradition to his children. So uh, he was apparently not allowed to be not here. That was the, um, you know, the saga. That was like the next thing ever. You would be, you would be surprised. Yeah. At, it would. At, everyone has their own saga. At yeah. the ritual committee meetings, discussions about who can touch it, even in a reform center. You can hear. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. Do you have the same discussions in the uh, you know, manual? Can, who can carry the Torah and who can't carry the Torah? And if you watch during a, a, a bar <laughs> bat mitzvah, and when they bring you know the family, the, all the families up on, on the Avon Hakodesh, uh, and, and I've watched uh, Rabbi Terry do it. She will kind of bring the Torah, the Torah to each person, and then take it from them. Person, but she will miss the non Jewish 
and that approach to the person. That's the line. Still the line. They drop. Yeah. And here the line is whether or not you can touch the floor. Yeah. So it, it does seem interesting, doesn't it? You, you know, it's very so. You know, it, it, a guy it, that always comes to us, which is he, well, he does it. See, so I, and, you know, he touches it, it which is it. In, in my mind, in, in my mind, I have a, I have. I have a problem. If we're light to the nations, I guess the question is, you know, yeah, the Torah, how the, is it that we all, we communicate that? Yeah. Do we communicate it with exclusivity and, I'm sorry, but you're not a member of my club? Who is or, the Torah? Or how is that? I mean, you know, how do we communicate that we want to be inclusive, but yet still actually do have some things that are special just for us? So some things that are, like, really special that we really hold, you know, as, as near and dear to our heart. How do, we, how, how do we do that? What do we mm -hmm. interpret the, who were the Torah written for? Oh, all to, true, too. To I mean, the world, right. the Torah was written for the world. Right. So if the Torah is written for the world, then why can't a non, a non Jewish person? I'm, I'm asking the question. I don't. No, no, I, 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 can I can that. we actually backtrack just a second? So you're saying that at Sinai, the Torah would be touched to someone that is Jewish, but someone that this, is this not is, observant? This is on the Bema. Mm -hmm. When there's a B'nai Mitzvah situation, you've got either a Bar Kav Mitzvah mm -hmm. and you've got some non-Jewish family members on the Bima at that time. And you're doing like the four generations. And, and, and yeah. often what's done is the, or, the, the Torah comes out okay. of the Ark and is passed from the eldest, from grandparents to parents to children. So then it's not passed to someone that's not Jewish. Well, apparently this is the current Minhag of Sinai. What, what happens if they're a convert? Change. What happens well, if they're a convert? That's what Really? Yeah, but the, the, the well, thing is that all the what the question is. <laughs> but but when, 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 when you're carrying the Torah to the congregation, people have who, the ability so, and someone sure. who's not Jewish who walks up and kisses the Torah, you say, and you don't know whether they're Jew, you know, I may not know whether that person's Jewish or not. I'm, oh, stop! What, what's also very interesting, in at least um, one show that I had participated in in Chicago, their minhag was to literally take Torah and pass it to each other. To each other. Yeah, I've seen that. Too. It takes a long time to do that, but it's one method of oh, you mean everybody you mean embracing it. Yes. Circles, the whole congregation. The entire congregation. Wow. How big is the congregation? It's small. It's not very big. Um, that's kind of beautiful. It, it is as small as ours or bigger or um, smaller. No, I'd say roughly the same size. I mean, how you know, we, we run maybe what forty-five people with Shabbos, so yeah. probably about that. One of my favorite moments is during um, um, Simchat Torah when we roll the Torah. We roll the whole yeah, story. boy, that's Everybody a process. Holds you know, a piece, a yeah, piece of it. Yeah, but that, that that's that's fairly modern in most congregations. Is it? That, that is, that How is, modern that is, is it, Simchat Torah? Well, Simchat Torah isn't modern. It, it's actually listed in, it's the question of how one celebrates it. it mm -hmm. It's right. biblical. So, I mean, it, it's kind of nice and kind of easy because, I mean, you know, otherwise the rabbis got to like roll the scroll. So this is just a, a convenient way, if nothing else, to get your scroll rolled. <laughs> well, and, and what a wonderful it's thing. Awesome. Symbology, Symbology is huge. It's beautiful. Circular, it's really quite lovely. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 you know, where I belong to, you can come on the wing stop, unroll it all the way down to the aisle, and have, especially all the kids come in and touch yeah. the bottom. Uh -huh. yeah. You know, and when you stop and look at it, here we're trying to teach kids to love, and, you know, the Torah and to bring it into them, yeah. and they never get to touch it. Mm. You know, you know, you know very, very few rabbis uh, have, w w when the Torah comes out, uh, of the, uh, the Yerod HaKodesh and the, and the blessings are done. Uh, so, well, we belong, we come on, rabbi used to call all the kids up always to do the blessings. Well, but that's, uh, this was, we, we just were in Brooklyn in the Las Vegas Bet Shalom. They had uh, 30 children in the Bima for the blessing thing, and then in Zilana, they also had children who yes. were there yes. on the Bima, and in my hometown, right back home, Wisconsin, yeah. or, and, was also, and there were a lot of children. Yes. And in terms of blessing children, starting out, I mean, we do that, like, you know, for my holidays, but generally, starting out with Kabbalah Shabbat with blessing children is a lovely and very traditional way to start Kabbalah Shabbat. It typically wouldn't be done 
prior to or for the Aliyah because you need someone who is at least of age. No, they, they, that person or so. of age would be there. I see, in addition to the children. Uh, yeah, and all the children come up. That's right. Sur Wait, you me. were going to say that, David? Well, as that too, so like that, that David, on his own the, the Hazan would read, read the last sentence of, of Deuteronomy. However, all the children come up and read the Rashi. Nice. Because it's like, like yeah. maybe yeah. they're second or third or fourth graders read the Rashi. It's kind of nice. Um, I learned in, in Minahab when I was at somebody's house a few months, a few weeks ago, wherein we do the blessing of the children even if they aren't there. Nice. That is and, nice. And I've begun doing and since that day, actually, yeah. since that Friday, I've done that every Friday. Since <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you, you're like you're like the perfect dad. Well, Well, my favorite story of him is the uh, bedtime shema. Yeah. yeah, but it's the, the most important is if you don't do that, it's like if you belong to uh, a house in uh, your household and you have children there and no one lights the Shabbat candles, how are the children going to know what's expected of them? Going to Sunday school mm -hmm. right. or going to Hebrew school does not ingrain in them what's ah. expected of them. That's only knowledge that they care for you. Before they care. I thought to you, my niece, so private, there is something about this. Sorry. Uh, uh, it's a very densely, densely populated neighborhood, like in New York. Yeah. And I was kind of amazed that my two children never lit Shabbat candles. And I mean, really? all a couple of times. Yeah, with her daughter. She just wasn't observant and, then. Uh, you know how many over the like you think it, all the Jews are observing? I'd say maybe ten percent are observing anything at all. They still consider Jewish. But what amazes them more is that this girl at the end married a Jewish guy from the same kind of family. They do absolutely nothing. Uh -huh. uh, well, she had bat mitzvah, of course, and it's probably cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. But then, like, then the Jews are like, and over it. But there is something that the Jews, the Jews as a really not a religion, Judaism is not a religion, it's a civilization. There is so much more to that that goes through, like listening to jokes in their houses in New York. It's like being in Shtel or whatever. It's the whole, it's, it's, it's whole, imbued into the culture. It's imbued in the culture. Where you walk on the street, you know, yeah. who you see every day, so, who's so, in school with you. I was okay. really surprised with this girl that uh, uh, she, she still went on marrying Jewish guy and they go through all this life cycle again. And okay. speak, speaking of which, um, I would say that perhaps the most popular of all Chagid is Passover. So that's what we're what, working what on a, today. What a segue. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, <laughs> it's all interesting. Okay, so. Um, this is an interesting today, conversation. Today we're working on Pesach. So our first Seder, we salute? At, at least according to our calendar, is on April 6th, or the 14th of Nisan, second Seder, April 7th, 15th of Nisan. So although this is sort of standardized in our calendar currently, we're going to read in Talmud, you know, questions like, when is Passover? Is it the 14th or 15th of Nisan? Do we know exactly? And what about... When do we get rid of this thing called comments? So what what is comments, anyone? Super interesting. Non non matza. Non matza. Okay, so what are those things? Anyone Barley, remember? wheat. Barley, wheat. What else? Corn or corn syrup. Actually, that falls into a different cat category. Isn't there five? Well, yes, but we're working on his issue, so corn and corn syrup. And wouldn't rice fall under that? No. Yeah. Yeah. Kidney uh, no. Kidney oat? No. Rice. In rice fall? It does. Friday communities will eat rice in, in, during the... Uh, but they use Wait, that's not the question. The question is, what's the category? The, what, the category is kidney oat. Okay, lentils, so, lentils and kidney oat. Okay, so lentils. What else is Legumes. back here under comments? Rye. Rye. There's five. Keep going. Barley, wheat, rye. Oats. Yep. Spelt. Mm -hmm. Oats and spelt. Okay, so these these are I have to change. Thank you, Governor. 
to spell. It's, we wouldn't have gotten it. <laughs> the spell might have been a little bit we, more we challenging. Oh, it, it's more genetically more. related, and that's why you okay. know the rabbis decided it. But you know, it's kind of interesting to me that oats probably weren't even grown in the ancient Near East. So, so that's anyway, modern. That's a modern because it can be fermented or sprouted. Essentially, because it, yes, it can become okay. It's at least according to rabbis. Okay, fermented. so we have this whole additional category called kidney oat. And it applies, as Mike said, to Ashkenazic, not to, Ashkenazic, not to Sephardic. And uh, there is, why, why not kidney oat? Why is one not, from an Ashkenazic perspective, allowed to eat kidney oat? Well, I think it's because you can make cornbread. Yeah, you can make rice cakes. OK, because you can bake it. Because it can be a flour, and it can be misconstrued as the five chametz. Marit ayin is the reason. So, yeah. Marit ayin. So it looks like these things. That's why, generally, in Ashkenazic communities, kidney oat are forbidden. Marit ayin, or, quote, like, appearing to be something. It's sort of like why some people choose not to eat Canadian bacon tofu, tofu Canadian bacon. Technically, you can eat it. You can eat bacon that's tofu, right? And yet so we read... And but the reason not to, if, if one chooses not to, is based on this. Marni onion. This is a, a, a rabbinic construct. You don't want to appear to be eating things. In fact, when I was in rabbinic school, uh, one of the interesting pieces was, is do you wear your people or not? into like an Indian restaurant that doesn't serve meat? Well, we could have a whole bunch of questions around kippas. We could, but this is, this relates to- I only wear mine when I study. But that's, the but issue is if but one- But you normally wear a kippah, like I went around Israel for the last time I was there, two weeks, wore kippah every moment. But one moment I opened up a menu, and you know, it says, oh, what a nice way to eat restaurant. And I assumed it was kosher, and then I got to the last page and thought, oh, look at that, it's not kosher restaurant. <laughs> Okay, and so, and there was an entire, like, issue about, you know, wear a kippa, don't wear a kippa if you're going into a restaurant that is not of the utmost kashrut. In Israel, that would be a normal kind of response of, oh, take a kippa off, right? Oh, the, uh, what, now, why would you take it off? Yeah, it's a good, good we, question. You have to make sure that a observant Jew is not misconstrued into believing this is a place you can eat. This oh. is the Mari Ayan issue. Well, well that makes sense. Mari Ayan. Mari Ayan. Look at that. Schwartz is eating there, it must be okay. I'm going to go buy it. No. Must and be And he's wearing a kippah. So I don't even know these Jews, but they're, they're wearing kippot. So they must be observant, so therefore, so this is the issue of I got it. Food. I got it. Because okay. otherwise you would never take it off. But there is a much more common situation in Israel is kavod, uh, kavod uh, gulato, what's, what's the name for that, when you put on the kippah when you get to the funeral. And in general, Israeli men, most of them carry, carry kippah in yeah, just in case they want that. They're going to a cafe or they're going to somewhere. Or they well, have I always mean to bring mine to the Bible study, but it's like I forget for everything else but this okay. arena. So that's a different conversation about when and why and who chooses to and who doesn't. Specifically with regard to going into a restaurant that's more behind. Okay, so uh, about comments, when do we get rid of it? Good question. According to, and, and we're going to deal with this in Talmud. So... We, we do Bedikat Kabetz at 8 p.m. Yeah, which is when it starts. So it's, it's not, it's within 23 hours of the actual holiday. So before April 6th, yes. we need to have our house completely hamets free. Yeah, yes. so, so therefore, working backward, it takes another whole day to do the cleaning. You have to find the one the search. Yeah, well, so, the, what? Yeah, that was. That was. Yeah, that's have, right. You handle a feather in a traditional yeah. setting to do that, right? That would be fun. So, but, I actually did that last kids, year. If you have little kids, what do you do? You you have you you hide a few uh, MMs so that they can find them. Yeah. And then you can burn them. Yeah. Exactly. So we we can eat it up until at least you know I'm following the Chabad calendar here, 10:48 a.m. on the 14th, and well, then although it's, that's far too late. Well, because the kitchen has to be completely converted. Yes, but if there's if there's one last piece of bread, you still have only one piece of bread, and one is planning to eat it, and it's in the refrigerator, wrapped in plastic. One can eat up to ten forty-seven, right? So, but just this year, or it's 
Every no, year. this is this year's based upon oh, the calendar, okay. so it's slightly different. Yeah, okay. But normally it's the morning, and normally okay. it's around All ten. Right. Okay. So then we burn it at ten forty-eight a.m. Okay. So that's the the time period. And actually, um, my son's a baby. They they have an accident one year, and, and some guy got his word beard burned. I mean, you know, burning. Yeah, I, it's not without its consequences of burning comments. One has to be very careful. With what's doing, especially if you're doing it for the community. And I know that in the past, um, Maggie Well has burnt comments, accepted comments, and burnt it. Okay, so what else do we do with comments? Give it away. We, sell it. we burn it. We so sell it. Are, okay. Yeah, but you're not supposed to give it away. We're not supposed to give it away. Why can you choose to? Well, some of the to give it away? You if, if, you know, if you are you permanently like getting rid of it, one can choose to do that in any form or fashion. But if, now the question in the fine line becomes, do we have to get rid of the legumes, the corn, the rice? Okay, so that, that, this is a different question. So yes. Ginio is a different issue. If one is Ashkenazic, then one follows it. If one is Spartic and follows the state of Israel, the answer is no. Typically in Israel, kidneyot is generally speaking, you know, they'll serve rice, they'll serve corn. It's corn. not really. In Israel, there's a big problem. Uh, yes. Actually, Dr. Uh, Jack yeah. said that they are working now on work, trying to work out something because there are so many, what you call it, marriages. Yeah. Yeah, this is Ashkenaz. 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 So they blend and the custom a little bit? Uh, and they, uh, they, no, they, well, they yeah. try yeah. now, apparently, according to Zachary, he just told us this. This is at some point that they are trying to blend it because there are a, that's considered a problem. Yeah, within Israeli it's new, true. newlywed families, where yes. they, they, they don't they, even think about your pet that comes to them. They say, Oh, my mother in law says it's, it's all right to keep in your and, and, and actually, from a halakhic standpoint, one follows the custom of one's husband. Well, oh, well, so yes. one can deal with that however one chooses. Okay. So, so we sell it like and make out. sure that it's sold prior to this period of time. Yeah, that's that's the Holocaust. Sorry. Okay. The other thing that we do is after the search, bitul. Okay. So bitul beads um, nullify. Right. It's like dust. So after the search, after the whatever evidence you found or such, then there's bitul and it. And there's like a, a prayer to nullify anything that might. We're going to deal with the issue of what if a mouse drags some in. We get to that, and and there's also the question of selling. You can't shoot meat from mouse shoot though. Yeah, on a practical point of view, these are these dates are all off by a, a whole day, because on a practical point of view, you start preparing, you start cooking two days before that. Yes, true. And, yes, and, right. And therefore, you've got to caution the kitchen three days from the house or four days from the house. Technically, yes. It takes a month to get your kitchen. Well, which is why <laughs> now that we've had four of them, we're on to this topic, right? So, <laughs> I, I, had, I had a certain accelerator. Okay, So one accelerator in at least modern preserve practice is that if you use a, a steam um, dishwasher, you know, a magic dishwasher that has a, a steam cycle, the steam, the boiling of the water inside the dishwasher will at least all um, utensils, all steel and, you know, and, and glass inside. Did, did Whether or not you believe it, it works with, with um, dishes or not. So my technique was I would just hire my normal cleaner and say, just run the entire kitchen for the dishwasher. And that would, that's like one full day's work. So I could caution the entire, my entire house, kitchen in one full day. And then, and then I, I and then clean every drawer. Yeah, and then whatever, whatever, when everything is out of that drawer, then you know, the dishwasher can kosher? Yeah. How come I had the thought that wasn't so? Well, in Orthodox practice, it's not true, but in conservative practice. Okay, so it depends upon. Once. So on the spectrum, exactly that. So, so, for example, if you need another. Well, I like the dishwasher. Forks, you, can boil, you can boil water on the stove and immerse the forks, and that koshers it. Okay? Yes, now I'm even familiar under, with that one. Even under Orthodox. So, so by Definitely extension, if it overflows, the water overflows, and yeah. you've koshered it. Right. By extension, the dishwasher would do the same thing because it immerses all the items in steam. There's also and there's heat. caveat that's called uh, which is 
when is when one is kashering, or arguably, if you're running it through, maybe you have to, in orthodox practice, run it through twice. But if one is using dish soap, it creates the the scenario of mente tangi thumb, which is not fit even for a dog to eat. That's the criterion. And if that's the case, then it's kosher. So if using dish soap, at least according to some, is one method of getting there. Anyway, so besides kidneyo, besides comments, there's another category. What is the additional category? Yesterday was matzah. Matzah shmura. Matzah shmura is one kind of matzah, but matzah that's soaked? A wet matzah. Yes, the broths. Let's see, let's see, broths, the broths. You're the baker. Yeah, that is Yiddish. Um, it's matzah shvira. 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 Broth is broken up. Right. Shvira is broken up. No, no, no. I'm not, not, I'm not talking shvira. No, I'm no. talking soaked. Soaked is the issue. If if matzah has been soaked, there is an entire group that will not eat soaked matzah because it's called it Yiddish. And does that mean that? Uh, it appears to rot? It appears to rise. Oh. When you soak it, it swells up. And it, it gives well, the I appearance of, of rising. And that's what, if you, and I forgot what it's called, some people will take barkle and put egg right. on it. And Matzo bread. No, just dip it in egg and bake it in the oven. Oh. And it gets lost so it doesn't absorb liquid, so you can sprinkle it in the soup. Okay, all right. So, uh, matzo shvulia. Yeah. yeah, so soaked matzah. So that's another category. It, if one is really so inclined, there's an entire discussion. Um, we'll pass it around. We'll write down the ISBN and debate it. If, if, if you think you need it, it just point it well, out. Well, you never know. It deals with cosmetics that's okay, not okay. Um, everything from pet food to... Uh, yeah. Candle wax and whatnot. So. Well, and what do you do in a dual household? Wait, wait I'm sorry. What, what they can oh, the, the <laughs> gal that lives there is not Jewish. Uh, it has to do with benefiting. But it, she doesn't want to eat anything that's green so. right now. So. Okay, so let's let's uh, move on to see how that goes. You know, one thirty-nine. That's your question. I think you I'm sorry, Diane, what was your well, question? In a, in a dual household. Um, well, like Teresa, I, I don't know what she's going to want to eat, and it's really difficult for me to say, oh, you can't do that for 50 days. 50? 49. Okay, so 49 no, days? No, no, eight days. Eight is really the, the magic number. I thought, I thought we did it the whole time. time. I thought the whole time. Not of, of the Obear? No. no. Good afternoon. Please, the Baka shop. So, um, no, it the uh, eight days isn't that long, right? If you, right. If you know, I mean, this has to do with the ownership of the food, is why, why you have to sell the food. So, if you, if you have, I can actually food. designate a part of the kitchen as being the as, sold as, section. Well, you can designate it as being her section, right? right. And, and that's it's not your food, it's her food, and she certainly can have whatever she wants on her shelf, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so I mean, you tape it, you know, whatever this is yours, this is whatever. Mine and your your whatever it is. If you're selling your comments, then that gets handled in a in a separately different. Monica's fashion. probably going to want to see it. Okay, so we're moving on to any any other questions before we move on. So we've dealt with the issues of when you search, when you up up to what time can you eat it, when you burn it. You are be told mechira, you brachs, kidney oats, and comments. Okay, when the Seder is, and the things that, that the rabbis are looking at in Talmud that we're going to talk about now is when do we get rid of our comments, when really is Passover, and what if a mouse dragged some of the comments in. Okay, so here we go. Okay, well, you, yes. you have some holidays or some things, you can move as much as three days. If you're talking about Havdalah, that's different. No, so. no, that's what Havdalah you can do up to what one. But there are there are some holidays you can move. Um, we, we just read uh, a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago, the Sunday you were here about moving holidays. Oh, 
know what this is, it's a marketplace. A reading tour or whatever. Monday and quality, Thursdays. Uh, mm -hmm. quality, the reason why we're reading the Torah on these particular days is because they were market they, days. they've established uh -huh. a Jerusalem had market days in those days. Right. And if market days Did you guys like anything to drink? Or something else was delayed. Uh, it Coffee? Was I don't think there's any made. How about tea? Oh, there's some. I can get. I, I think I got yeah, it. Yeah, but there were some other some holidays you could move up to three days. It was, it was and like and in Talmud, that right. may be true. That was slow time. So Talmud may have allowed that. I mean, we, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think. We've got. Um, I think we're moving Passover. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we're not moving Passover. <laughs> <laughs> So let's start as we typically do with our uh, our Chumash, which is at uh, one thirty nine. And actually, I think Rivka, can you would you mind sharing with Alan? So, Alan, do you want to go back to one thirty nine? Yeah, because we're, we're we missed this earlier. We, we seven, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the very first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. No leaven shall be found in your houses Oops. for seven days. But really says on the very first day you shall remove. And, and so that's the question. That's what, right. is, what is the first day? Yeah, what did we deal with that? That's mm -hmm. why I was told you to do the search right. within the 23 hours of the beginning of the harvest. Well, it's, the first day is still a question because is it the first day of Pesach or is it the first day of the month? Which is another issue. Right. So we're going to deal with that shortly. Um, Rivka, would you like to read the Mishnah there? On the night of the 14th of Nisan, you must search for comets by the light of a lamp. There is no need to search places where you do not put comets. Although that's probably in current um, Orthodox Meshuggah practice, which is, and, and seriously, I have some friends. You know, you go through every book and you do this. Because you might have, like, you know, been eating and gotten crumbs in your books, right? So, and... And although it's not a chumrah, it's it, and and rabbis like go through this thing of it's not necessary. It says here in Talmud and Mishnah, people enjoy doing it. So for whatever reason. But if you have kids and they drive their crackers throughout the house. And and if they're they're reading your Talmud and and they happen to have a particular affinity to your Jerusalem Talmud and Kayal or something. <laughs> so I, okay. If you have kids, they don't. So you have ten kids, kids you don't know. But not everybody follows. Every, every, no, in every cranny. And, and so, like, every, on top of the blinds, right? right? Not just the bottom. But but right. this is, you know, a cobra on a cobra. And people do it because they enjoy the, you know, the sugarness of the cup. I thought it was called spring cleaning. Yeah, that works too. Rivka. In what circumstances would they say two rows of barrels in the cellar must be searched? Only if you might put a hummus there. Gula Shema, Shema I say, two rows means two rows across the whole area of the cellar. But the school of Hillel say two rows means the two outer rows. That is the two uppermost ones. So in other words, Hillel is going to say, you don't have to search everywhere, just the most likely, the most easiest, the most convenient. And, you know, it's not going to be like in the back of the inner and the whatever. So, well, my, my guess is, I mean, we, we know that there were, yeah, kegs of wine, whatever, the barrels usually came with well, wine. If you had a cellar, the cellar was cooler and you could store Things vegetables. Longer vegetables. Yeah. You could store but grains and stuff barrels. as long as it wasn't damp. So, uh, Diane, Monica, and the G. Well, let's see. I, I think I, my question went out of my head. Okay, Monica. I didn't ask. Okay, sorry. Judy, did you have a comment? No. no. Uh, Our barrels, I just, bar barrels were used for storing wine, uh, but also like oh, saving the yeah. vegetables over the period of the winter time in like some kind of a brine. Uh, brine. Yeah. Yeah. I know my house would be yeah. impossible to go through every single book. Oh, yeah, your house, did, that would certainly be a challenge. Uh huh. Thought about so you, you can book. sell your books. <laughs> you can oh. sell your books. Then I, then I sell the house, right? Well, no, I, and I go live in a motel room no, for eight I, days. I, I'm being serious with regard to Yahira, who would choose to sell the books uh -huh. to someone who would sell it back. Well, I mean, in a period of time. you'd have to decide how, how crazy you want to go. That's exactly, like, that is exactly the question. Okay, so moving on to... There are those who don't confront the issue by moving. That's 
they that, that's they, true. They move to, there's hotels. Which there's hotels, there. there's cruise ships, there's there's methods. Oh, the 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 I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, that'd be nice. Entire, I can handle the cruise. Far from the whole time. That's a little crazy. Really? Yeah. Most, oh, you've never done it? Oh, she has. Oh, that's okay. I have friends like that, too, who I grew up with. They're in, in the house, so it's a separate, complete separate area that was used for Passover, and they've been living for 30 years. Okay. Really? Mm -hmm. No, I've heard of wow. it. Wow. Go ahead, Rivka. On the 14th? On the 14th is literally at light on the 14th. Okay, so it's saying in the actual text, at light. However, it's like some of these other comments that we get, which are, may so and so be blessed. Which really means the opposite. All right, so go ahead. Go Mara. So Mara concludes that the expression is a euphemism. Light here stands for dark, as in the Aramaic idiom, Sabi Nahor, one who has plenty of light, for a blind person. And it offers advice in the general use of euphemism to avoid unpleasantness. unpleasantness. It is generally accepted that Thomas was prohibited on the afternoon of the 14th of Nisan, i.e. the afternoon preceding Pesach. Why then has it oh, 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 oh. sorry? So this is not clearly stated in scripture. The sages speak proof texts. Days are regarded as commencing at dark on the previous evening. If for instance the 15th of Nisan falls on Thursday, it commences at nightfall on Wednesday night. Daylight hours are reckoned by dividing the period from sunrise to sunset when two twelve is Okay, so we've seen this before in terms of how we get to exactly what time is it that we are searching. If we're searching till the fifth hour, the sixth hour, etc. So that explains how we get to, you can eat it up to 1048 a.m. and burn until 1148, at least this year. Um, Diane, what do you have? Uh, a Mishnah states, Rabbi Mir says, they eat hamets throughout the fifth hour and burn what is left over at the beginning of the sixth. Rabbi Judah says they eat hamets throughout the fourth hour, wait through the fifth, and burn what is left over at the beginning of the sixth. Evidently, they both agree that it's forbidden to eat hamets after the sixth hour. On what is this based? Okay, so before we answer that question, we obviously follow Rabbi Meir, right? Because our practice is eating through 1048, burning the next hour. Okay, so we're following the practice currently of Rabbi Meir. Okay. Abaya uh, said, it is based on two verses. One states, no leaven shall be found in your houses for seven days, Exodus 12, 19, and the other states, so that's a lot better than 50 days. But on the first day, you shall remove leaven from your houses. What does this imply? The 14th of Nisan is added both for the seven as a day to remove hamets. Okay, so if you could get the, yeah, please. Okay. Abaya yeah, point is that if Hametz is forbidden on the 15th Nisan, the first day of Passover, it makes no sense to say it must be removed on that day. We must therefore understand by Yom HaRishon as by the first day, then on the first day. Okay. So, and, and Ellen commented, okay, so we have seven days or eight days, you know, and if I look here, I see, you know, in my calendar here, this is the, the Chabad one, we've got eight days. Right, so wait a second, I thought it was seven. In Reform and Reconstructionist, it's seven, but... Orthodox, it's in eight. Orthodox, we're looking at eight. At least that's the current practice. Yes. Yes. Is every year... The diaspora, thank you, yes. Is every, oh. Um, what do you say, but it's, but, it's uh, are you sure that... Seven uh, you got just, it. Uh, the Reform will drop the last day? Be because of this whole issue, we, it, typically Reform doesn't do like second day Yom Tov. Yeah, right, yeah. so Rosh Hashanah, you know, yeah. first day, not not necessarily second day, Rosh Hashanah, right? So from a, a diaspora yeah. standpoint, they're celebrating seven, not the eight, because yeah. it's a diaspora issue, but the, not a Passover issue. But why oh. do they start on the third, uh, uh, on a, don't start on the 15th? Why do they start on the 14th? The first center that Sinai has the dinner at London is on uh, 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 it is because that's the day of the first Seder. Are you guys doing second day? 
we uh, our temple always that I never been to our temple, but it's always that in the second. Right, because the tradition is in in conservative typically practice. practice. On first day, you'd be having Seder at home. Right. But the question is why uh, why the reform doesn't start from the second day because no, it should start in fifteenth. Because generally, if people didn't get to celebrate on the first day, they might not celebrate. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yes. So that if they're not having it at home, if they're not having it at home, it, I, I mean, is that your question? Uh, my, uh, well, if you, you can say that a diaspora rules do not apply to us who just celebrate one day for Rosh Hashanah and one day for Passover. Right, right but, but Passover is seven days, but we have two days of Seder. Yeah. Right. Why do they celebrate the so if if one is in an Orthodox yeah, setting, one's going to celebrate eight yeah. days. Just, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. Do, am I understanding? Yeah. Am but, I, uh, but in Israel, the first night is celebrated the year of Nisan 15th, right? And, and here also, I mean, it's still the 14th. It's being celebrated. The 14th is on the 6th, which is a Friday night. We're doing also our, our uh, yeah, the, uh, Passover this year. Bethor is doing Friday night because, quite frankly, for us, it's going to be too difficult to manage kosher dinner for 80, which is what we did last year. On Shabbos, it's right. I can't manage. Right. So, you, so you have you have nine days. I'm not sure. You had you had no, your no, first no, 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 no. seder, and you should have the last seder, and then after the last okay. seder, you have you have a special okay, holiday so, that's called Chinese restaurants. Okay, <laughs> Chinese restaurants, right? Okay, so we're 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 looking at night one, two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then it ends here in the, in the evening by eight. Because that's the end of Shabbos. Is that pizza? No. Right. We definitely go out for pizza on the fourteenth, on the night of the fourteenth. Or Chinese. Or Chinese. Pizza is the established establishment. Yes, it is. Pizza is the establishment. Chinese. Because you can create pizza after. Totally. Different than how different. So the form stands one day short, as opposed to start one day late. Right. Okay. Now what's interesting is that's what we're talking about restaurants. And reconstructions. In Israel, yes. we can't go out to a restaurant the day before. So all restaurants are closed on the um, in Israel the Thursday night. Yeah. Because they have they have their they have to clean torching, you know, their ovens and everything. I've always I've, I've, I've always wanted to go to the Iraq for Passover. Because. <laughs> okay. I think we're all coming to visit you and do a field trip. I think so. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Alan. <laughs> next, not, not this year, but next year. Alan, that would be fun. That would be fun. We got to the house. the other day. Bruce is going to uh, work that trip. Awesome. Congratulations. I'm, awesome. I'm really excited about that. So it ends the next night because sundown yeah. is the close of the evening before. It's just all yeah, Saturday, the normal the cycle. Saturday at 8 o'clock will be the end. Saturday at 8 o'clock will be the end. It will be the end of Passover. That's right. It's the 14th. So we all meet the pizza part right after that. Yes, the night of the fourteenth. After eight eight thirty. <coughs> so yeah. after eight o'clock we have hamets. Eight thirty. Eight thirty. Yeah. So that's it. Exactly. Yeah. That's where. Okay. So moving on here. Okay. So moving right along. <coughs> let's see footnote two. Okay. Why not say instead that the second verse is needed to include the night of the 15th as a time by which hamets must be removed? We might, after all, think that as scripture writes, day it means days, not nights. So the second verse is needed to tell us that nights are included in the prohibition. No, the verse is not needed for that since removal of leaven is compared to the prohibition of eating hamets. In the prohibition of eating hamets to the command to eat matzah. Removal of leaven is compared to the prohibition of eating hamets, for it is written, No leaven shall be found in your houses for seven days, for whoever eats hamets will be cut off. Okay, so think about it this way. When it says cut off, that's uh, karait, which is a very serious kind of, of issue, right? Nobody wants to have karait, right? It's, it's either being cut off in the community, being cut off, you know, by, by heaven, and one's days are like shortened under that, you know, kind of theory. At any rate, that's a serious issue. So that's why the rabbi is so worried, considerate about when exactly is it that we have to get rid of this stuff called comments? When is that? And we've got to make sure we get it right. 
Because of what it says in Torah. Oh, 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 wait, wait, wait. Kind of mild because for breaking yeah. a body, you're supposed to be killed. So. Yeah, well, there was that, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't remember any place in Torah where it said they were going to come down from heaven and strike everyone dead because they didn't do that. I didn't read that in Torah. It, it's correct, correct, and it's a question of how one well, defines it. Excuse me. Yes. It's, it's, how if you're cut off like, from your, your community, you're going to live a much shorter life. Typically true, and and in the old days it actually meant like lack of food depending upon what one was doing or not doing. Okay, so um, Bobby, you want to pick up? Well, I'm just ice cream. Right here. <laughs> actually, I didn't think you were going to listen. Yeah, right yeah. there. We're, we're at the top of 141. Thank you. Hamas will be cut off, which is what Diane just said. The problem. And then it's, it would be great if Hamas was cut off. What's the metaphor for Hamas? When we're, we're we're doing all of this stuff. We're not just cleaning our ego. comments. We're, we're cleaning out ego. Exodus in Egypt. We're cleaning Egypt out of our souls. Right. And comments is the metaphor. What is the metaphor for ego? I did say ego. Ego. I'm sorry, sorry. I said ego. I, I said it. ego. You were right then. But there's no ego here. Tov ma'od. Metsuyan. You got it. <laughs> to say yeah. it. Am I crazy? Yes. No, you were right. Sugar. You were right. Well, you know, we, we, yeah, it is we crazy. discussed that with the professionals, and we came to the conclusion we were right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I see her right at the end. No, thank you. Anyway, so the prohibition, of, the prohibition of eating comments is compared to the man you eat matzah. For it is written, you shall eat no hummets in all your dwellings. You shall eat matzah. And of matzah it is written, in the evening you shall eat matzah. Then perhaps a second verse is needed to add the night. Add, oh, I guess it does say to add the night of the fourteenth as a time by which hametz must be removed. No, this cannot be so, since Scripture says, "Why on the first day, Exodus twelve fifteen? Perhaps it means in the morning. No, since but implies a division of the day. It was taught in the school of Rabbi Ishmael that we find the fourteenth is called first, and as it is said. In the first, on the 14th day of the month, Exodus 12, 18. Okay, um, the uh, footnote three, please. A puzzling statement, since first in this verse clearly refers to the month, not the day, and the occurrence of the first that would be relevant to the interpreter as previous in verse 15. Thus, a boat draws attention to the problem. Okay, so now we're like hung up on this word first. What really does it mean? Let's like parse this out. So, Rav Nachman Bar Yitzhak says, no? Oh, Rav Nachman Bar Yitzhak said, first mm -hmm. means mean previous, as in scripture says, were you, were you the first of men to be born? So they're, 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 they're still looking. What, is, what does first, first mean, right? Then what about you shall take to yourself on the first day? Can it possibly mean the previous day truly not? It is different for it continues, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days, just as the seventh day must be the seventh day of the festival, so the first day in this context is the first day of the festival. Okay. Then in connection with Pesach, likewise, it is written, but on the first day you shall remove, for seven days you shall eat matzo. So how can you explain in this context the first means previous? If it means, uh, if it just means man first, scripture would have written first day. Why then has it written the first day? The day first, first day. day. The. What's this? Yeah. The thing. So now we're going to like try to figure out why is the the there. This <laughs> must be, as we said, namely that here it means previous. Okay, so the is implying not the 15th, it's the 14th. But the identical expression is used in the verse cited from the Leviticus in connection with the festival of Sukkot. So why is the first day written there too? Moreover, there is a different article is used there. It doesn't have to be twice, for it is written. On the first day shall be a psalm read, and on the eighth day a psalm read. Remember this. There is different than scripture writes the eighth day 
shall not be shall be a day of some rest. It must be the first day, the eighth day of the festival. So likewise, when it states this earth, it must mean the first day of the festival. Then why does it use the definite article? It must be to exclude the middle day of the festival. That surely that follows from explicitly stating the first and the eighth. Not necessarily since you might have thought that as scripture, as scripture writes, and on the eighth day, the conjunction and implies an addition to what is specified that is where to understand the, the middle day are included. Okay, so the and gives us the, the whole of a leg, right? It's the middle of the festival. He therefore uses the definite article to inform us that that would be an incorrect inference. Okay. I'm going to go back to my original theory. Okay. The, the, the rabbi and the, the scholars of Talmud. They were, were good lot, lawyers. They were, had a lot of lawyers. They were good lawyers. And they said, what are people going to do 300 years from now when they read this? It's more like 1,500. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Mike, you want to pick up? Because I'd like to get through just this sure. this little section through the middle of 143 there because we're going to finish up with the first there's a few more firsts in scripture that's how they're they're pulling out proof text to bring what does the mean what does and mean what is first so go ahead <coughs> then let the torah use neither the conjunction or the definite nor the, nor the, the, nor the definite article moreover since it states here on the first day you shall have a holy convocation. Leviticus uh, 23:25. Surely, first there could be understood as previous. So we must abandon the idea that first in this context means previous, and instead we use the threefold repetition of the first in Leviticus 23 as it was interpreted in the school of uh, Rabbi Ishmael. <clears throat> or it was taught in the school of Rabbi Ishmael. The, the merit of the three firsts, they earned the three firsts, namely the destruction of the seed of Esau, <clears throat> the building of the temple in the name of the Messiah. Messiah and the destruction of the seed of Esau, as it is written, and the first came out bloody all over the hair. Like a hairy cloak. So this, this had to do with when Esau was born. So the first, <coughs> okay, that's one of them. And this, the second one here? The gentleman with the building of the temple, as it is written, a glorious high throne, and the first is, is the place of our temple from Jeremiah. Jeremiah in the name of the Messiah as it is written behold the first of his name okay all right so they're they're just pulling up three more places that they remember and recall where it says is the first on the 15th of Nisan is it on the 14th and so this is why probably we have a search for it we can eat it up until and then a time for burning, mm -hmm. okay? So this is how we ended up with, okay, when really is the time to get rid of comments? Right. All right. But so, in reality, like Alan was saying, everybody's going to have to have their kitchens and everything clean early. long before that fifth yeah. hour, the long before the sixth copy, hour. Copy yes. um, the reality is, you know, if you have a half-open jar of something in the refrigerator, you discard it. So... In some, in some cases, and you're not supposed to give it away. It's very straightforward. Like, let's say you had a half-open jar of jelly, jelly that's just made out of strawberries and sugar. Normally, that would be fine. However, you know that someone probably dipped their knife in peanut butter, smeared on the bread, and dipped that same knife in the jelly. You know, so therefore, that jelly is contaminated, probably, probably as it is. So if that, it doesn't have gabrops in it made with corn syrup, which is a whole other issue. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, right. kidney oats, so right, I'm which sorry. is like another piece about, you know. So yeah. the other problem with American prepared food is that almost all American prepared food has corn syrup in it. Almost every single one. Yeah, you have to really Well, corn syrup is huge. So therefore, you have to really get rid of everything in your refrigerator, pretty much. Yeah, especially things like lettuce. And so, 
Well, relish is, is, is relish is gone. Relish is probably not okay, but mustard is probably okay. So mustard. So if I see mustard, mustard, kind of mustard, mustard. unscrew and put a knife in. So okay. do, we mustard, at, okay. do we well, have to look at? Do we have to? If you want, you have to think about. Now that's why my mother told me to use teaspoons for everything. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, there, see, yeah, like we have yeah. teaspoons here. You know, yeah. take it out and put right. it in your hand instead of yeah. So this is this is Diane's question. Have you, are we all? Do we do? Are we all? No. Okay. So. Goodbye, everybody in TV land. Um.